Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, my talk for today on Huntington's disease genetics, what's new and what's not. And I know that's a profoundly titled talk, so I'll, I'll get to that later. Uh, my name is Matt Bauer, and I'm a genetic counselor at the University of Minnesota Health Clinics. And um, just a little bit about myself. I've been a genetic counselor at the University of Minnesota since 2001. And I do work both in the clinic here in the adult neurology clinic and in our molecular diagnostics laboratory. Um, so I have sort of a foot in both worlds. I see patients who come in for predictive testing, diagnostic testing, um, other types of testing. And I also work in our molecular diagnostics lab here at the University of Minnesota. And so I have experience both in um, seeing patients and also in doing the molecular genetic testing that we do for Huntington's disease. Um, and I, like I said, I apologize for the bad title, but sometimes simple words explain what your goals are for the talk. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is a little bit about what's new, but to talk about what's new, we have to review what's not new, um, just to make sure everybody has the same grounding in Huntington's disease genetics. Um, so we're gonna go through real quick and just review autosomal dominant inheritance, finding the Huntington's disease gene, and testing for Huntington's. And I acknowledge that probably many, many people listening in today are certified experts on these topics, but the idea is just to give everybody the same vocabulary and grounding in these concepts. And then for what's new is I'm going to talk a little bit, you guys, probably some of you have heard about this, maybe um, what's new in terms of the complexity of the HD repeat. So we're used to talking about CAG repeats, and I'm going to let you know that there's actually more complexity to this than what we talk about usually. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that. So that is my roadmap for today. So starting with what's not new, um, autosomal dominant inheritance. Uh, we talk about this with Huntington's. I think a lot of people are familiar with it, but we use these words autosomal dominant and don't always define what we mean by that. And so when we use the word autosomal, the way I tend to think about it, and I think the simplest way to think about it is that both males and females can be affected with Huntington's disease and that both males and females can pass Huntington's disease on to their children or onto the next generation. And so there's a little bit more complexity to what autosomal actually means, but from a practical standpoint, to me, those are the important principles of autosomal dom, I'm sorry, autosomal inheritance, that both males and females can have Huntington's and are able to pass it on. Dominant, there's a few um, pieces of information that are important with dominant. One is that if a person has Huntington's disease, there's a 50% risk for each of their children. And that 50% risk, I always like to emphasize, is independent for each child. And so if somebody who has Huntington's has four children, 50% doesn't mean that two get it and two don't. It means that each of those children has their own independent 50% risk for Huntington's. A couple of other things that come from this are that if a person does not inherit the Huntington's mutation, so if you're a person whose parent had Huntington's and you have a genetic test and it's normal, um, you will not get Huntington's and you cannot pass it on to your children. And so in other words, Huntington's disease, the gene does not skip generations. If you don't inherit it in the first place, you can't pass it on to your children. Conversely, if a person knows that they have the gene for Huntington's, then each of their children in turn has that 50% risk. And Dr. George Huntington, this is kind of where the name of the disease comes from, was really credited with being the first person to recognize this pattern of inheritance, which is really interesting because it was actually right around the time that Gregor Mendel was doing his experiments with peas and first described these patterns of inheritance. And so Dr. Huntington was the one who's really able to map those ideas onto Huntington's disease. All right. So looking at sort of a graphic example, when we're in genetics, we like to draw these pedigrees. If any of you have ever seen a genetic counselor, you've seen us draw all these squares and circles. And this is how we draw out a family history of Huntington's. And in this picture, the people in red have a clinical diagnosis of Huntington's. And for the sake of this example, have both had genetic testing to confirm the diagnosis. And so there is someone up in the top generation affected. And then his son here in the picture is affected. And that just goes to show that for Huntington's disease, most of the time, someone who has Huntington's will have an affected parent. Now, there are some exceptions to that. And we'll talk about some of those here in a little bit. 
moving on down this example, um, each of the children that are circled in red has an independent 50-50 risk. And so those two gentlemen in red on the pedigree, the two squares, they both have Huntington's. The three individuals who are circled, two males and a female, each of them has their own 50% risk for inheriting Huntington's disease. If this person in the pedigree has a normal genetic test, so if this person seeks to have predictive testing and they get back a normal result, then we know that that person will not develop Huntington's disease. And we know that any children that that person has or may have in the future are generally not at risk for having Huntington's disease. And like I talked about, there's some exceptions to this a little bit that we'll talk about a little bit. For the most part though, if that person has a stone cold normal result, they will not get Huntington's and cannot pass it to their children. If this person here um, came in around the same time and decided to have a genetic test for Huntington's and it's abnormal or positive, we know that that person would develop Huntington's disease in a normal lifespan. And each of that person's children, in this case, he has one daughter, has that 50-50 risk. And so we've actually understood this inheritance pattern. Even though we hadn't discovered the gene for Huntington's, this inheritance pattern was fairly well recognized for many, many decades before we had the gene. Um, and so understanding this, you know, we, we understood how it was passed in families, but we did not know the actual details of what the gene was or what the actual mutation was in the gene. And that's because a lot of the important groundwork that we needed to really go and find this gene was not established until well, well into the 20th century. And those, those types of tools and groundwork include the discovery of DNA, the discovery of many of the, of the molecular genetics tools that we needed to go find the gene. So from sequencing, PCR, you know, up to like the Human Genome Project, all of these things didn't exist you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Another important piece of groundwork that had to be in place beyond these technical laboratory pieces was really this organization of patient advocacy groups to really mobilize the effort to find the gene and to mobilize families and patients affected with Huntington's disease to participate in these efforts. And so really both of these things needed to happen in order for us to find the gene. We needed to have the technical molecular genetics tools but we also needed to have this incredible patient organization um, to collect families together, to encourage people to collaborate with researchers to work on finding this gene. And so I always think it's, it's, you know, it's a question we skip over sometimes. Why look for genes? Why is it important to look for genes? Um, we just take it for granted that we're going to go find a gene. Um, and I think it's just really critical to know for, for Huntington's disease and really for any genetic disease, if you ask the question, why does it happen? What is the cause of the disease? The cause of the disease is buried in that DNA sequence of the gene. When, it, when a condition is genetic, we know that the very fundamental clues as to what causes that disease to happen is buried in that genetic code. And building from that, you really can't hope to find an effective cure for a disease if you have not yet identified what actually causes it. And so I think this is a really, really critical point. We don't just find genes for the sake of finding genes. We find genes so that we can understand at the most fundamental level what is causing the disease and how does that open up avenues for treatment, okay? And so it's a really, really critical thing we need to know to start going down those avenues. Beyond that, um, finding a gene allows us to answer some of these really critical fundamental questions that patients ask. Um, patients want to know, I've got some symptoms. Is this Huntington's disease? I want to have a diagnostic test. Um, patients ask questions like, am I going to develop Huntington's disease? I know it's in my family and I want to know if I'm going to get it or not. Other people may be asking questions about prenatal or pre-implantation genetic testing. So I'm a young person who I know I've got the gene for Huntington's, for example, and I want to know, could I have children that don't get this genetic change? And to be able to answer any of these questions in this last part of the slide, you need to have the actual gene. 
And so again, finding a gene is critical both for the effort to find a treatment or a cure, and also to answer these really basic and profoundly important questions that patients ask about whether they have Huntington's or not, or whether or not it's going to be passed on to the next generation. All right, finding the Huntington's gene. If you ever get a chance to read uh, Mapping Fate by Alice Wexler, it's a wonderful account of the story to find the Huntington's gene. And it was an incredible collaborative effort that involved clinicians, so physicians working with patients with Huntington's, scientists who are working with the latest molecular genetics tools, and also patients and families. And, and you needed all three of these groups working together to be able to identify and find the gene for Huntington's disease. And really it's this, I think, spirit of collaboration that carries through today as we move to sort of the next phase, as we begin talking about gene therapy trials, it's the same collaboration of, of the clinicians who care for the patients, the scientists who develop um, the treatments, and also the patients and the families who, who participate in these trials and organize the efforts. It is a collaborative effort that continues through to today. And so really in 1979, this was a completely ambitious, audacious goal. And this is when really the hunt for the Huntington's gene began because we lacked so many of these tools that we have today. And if you read through some of the accounts and the stories, I'm not gonna go through those all today in the sake of time. It was, probably, it was a several decade process to really hone in and find this gene. And in 1993, a paper was published in which um, scientists and physicians identified what the gene was that was involved with Huntington's disease. And I think one really key important point about this publication in 1993 is what I have circled on here, which is that there's no authors listed. And for people outside the scientific community, authorship really is sort of that it's such an important thing for the advancement of scientific careers and academic and, and physician careers is being the person who takes the credit for a discovery on a paper. And with this paper, none of those authors took credit. And actually what that was, was just an acknowledgement that this was not the individual effort of any particular scientist or physician. This was the community really that found the gene for Huntington's disease. And so I think it's a very nice footnote in the history of the Huntington's disease genetics that there was a recognition that this effort really was a collaboration and was not the effort of just one person or scientist. So when the gene was found in 1993, it was originally called IT15. If anyone had genetic testing decades ago, they might see this name on their report, IT15. It stands for Interesting Transcript 15. Um, today, the name of the gene has changed to HTT. Um, it's just an abbreviation, somewhat arbitrary. I think one important point when we talk about the Huntington's gene um, I always like to make sure that people understand that the Huntington's gene is normal part of our body. Every human being on the face of the earth has two different copies of the Huntington's gene because it does something really critical that is, that is essential for the normal functioning of our body. And so it can be a little bit of a misnomer when we say, hey, this person has the Huntington's gene because in fact, we all actually have two copies of this gene. But what happens in Huntington's disease is that one of those copies is changed and starts to do something bad or toxic in the body. So again, just stressing, we all actually have two copies of the Huntington's gene. And when we say that a particular person has the gene for Huntington's, what we're really trying to communicate is that one of their copies of the gene has changed in a way that causes Huntington's. And so there's a very, very specific change in the spelling of the gene that causes Huntington's. And what that change is, a lot of you now are familiar with CAG repeats or CAG repeats, people call them. There's a series of repeated letters in the Huntington's disease gene that goes over and over again, CAG, CAG, CAG. And I'm dating myself a bit when I say it's almost like a record player, a CD player where something skips and just goes over and over and over again. The same type of thing happens in the Huntington's gene. There's a series of letters in the genetic code, CAG, that are repeated over and over again. And for every person on earth, we again all have two copies of this gene. We may have two different repeat numbers. We get one of those repeat numbers from our mom and we get another repeat number from our dad. And as long as both those repeat numbers are in the normal range, 
that's perfectly fine. It's just part of all the human variation that makes us all different. But if one of those numbers is too large, that is what causes Huntington's disease. And so in, in clinic, when we use this shorthand of saying, hey, this person has the gene for Huntington's, or we say to a patient, you've got the Huntington's gene, what we really are saying is on your two different copies of the Huntington's gene, one of the copies has too many of these CAG repeats. All right. Okay. So when we're doing testing for Huntington's or when you're doing testing as a patient or somebody who's at risk, what you'll often hear back when you talk to your physician or genetic counselor is you'll get your repeat numbers, your CAG numbers or whatever you may call them. And there's certain established ranges that we use for interpreting these results. And these, these interpretation ranges are based on our experience over the last probably about three decades of, of testing. And they just represent a consensus of how we interpret the different repeat sizes we see. And so if somebody has a genetic test for Huntington's and both of their repeat numbers are between nine and 26, we call that a normal result. And what we mean by normal result is that repeat numbers in that range do not cause Huntington's. And we say that they also are not at risk for expanding when they're passed on to the next generation. And so the official way we would interpret repeat numbers in this nine to 26 range is that they do not cause Huntington's and there's not a significant risk for the repeat number growing when they're passed to the next generation. Now I'm gonna skip down to the other end of the range on that slide, which is the 40 plus repeats, then we'll get back to the stuff in the middle. Um, if one of the copies of the gene has 40 or more repeats, that is what we call a full penetrance or full mutation in the Huntington's gene. And we know that everybody who lives a normal lifespan, 75, 80, 85 years, if they've got 40 repeats in one of their copies, they will get symptoms of Huntington's disease. And there's a 50% risk for Huntington's disease in the next generation, okay? So those are kind of, in a sense, on the bookends, the easy ranges, the normal and the full penetrance, because they're the most black and white in terms of what they mean for the patient. Now, those other two ranges are a little bit trickier, and once in a while we see these in testing. 27 to 35, if one of your copies of the gene has a repeat number in the 27 to 35 range, we typically say that there's no risk for Huntington's, but there's a small risk that that number could grow when it's passed. And so there's a small risk for Huntington's disease in the next generation. Now I'm gonna to touch on in a second, these ranges and these cutoffs aren't as black and white as I'm making them seem on the slide. And there are some people at the upper end of this intermediate range, maybe 34, 35 repeats, who really, really look like they have symptoms of Huntington's. And so I think we're starting to understand that maybe sometimes these ranges aren't quite as black and white and, and discreet as we make them. Okay? This other range in here that I, that's the last one to talk about, 36 to 39, we call that reduced penetrance. And what reduced penetrance means is that some people in this range will develop symptoms of Huntington's. So some people with 37 repeats will get Huntington's during their lifetime. Other people may live a full lifespan, 75, 80 years, and never get Huntington's. And we don't yet fully understand why some people do and some people don't. And working with patients, I often find these are some of the more frustrating results because usually people come to me with a very black and white yes, no question am I going to get Huntington's or not? And the answer in this case is tricky because it's sort of a, the answer is maybe. And so they came for a yes or no, and the answer is maybe. So they can be frustrating from that standpoint. With those repeat numbers though, there is still that 50% chance that that abnormal repeat would be passed to each of their kids. So these are the official ranges that we use to interpret Huntington's. Now, what are the different types or scenarios where we would do genetic testing? And these are somewhat, again, arbitrary. I'm just dividing things into category to help us talk about them today. One type of genetic testing that we do is diagnostic testing. And really the different types of testing that I'm about to talk about, they aren't different in terms of what we're doing in the lab. They're more different in terms of what is the clinical story or the clinical scenario. And so for diagnostic testing, we're typically talking about a situation where a patient is coming to us with symptoms. 
And sometimes they may know that Huntington's is in their family and they've got symptoms of Huntington's and they're just coming in to confirm, yes, I do also have Huntington's like my parent or my grandparent. In other cases, the family history may not be as clear. So there may not be a clear family history of Huntington's, but they've got symptoms that look like Huntington's. And again, we're doing a diagnostic test to answer the question, is the cause of the symptoms you're experiencing, is the cause Huntington's? And for a lot of patients in this scenario, the Huntington's disease genetic test may in some sense be the end of a diagnostic odyssey. They may have been seeing a few neurologists, doing a few different tests to figure out what's going on. People weren't thinking about Huntington's because it's not in their family. And when we finally do the Huntington's test, we figure out what's going on and get that answer. And it can give both important information to the patient to answer the question of why am I experiencing these symptoms? And it also gives some important information for their family. It tells us, are other family members at risk? And if so, how big is that risk? I'm sure everybody again on this talk, you guys are all pros at Huntington's genetics. You're familiar with the idea of predictive testing. Um, this isn't as common in some other genetic disorders, but really Huntington's disease was sort of the pioneering condition where we first really began to think through the idea of predictive testing many, many decades ago. The idea that you could do a genetic test before somebody has symptoms that tells you at some point in the future that person is going to develop a condition. And so generally we talk about predictive testing in cases where the patient is asymptomatic and they're doing the testing to know, am I going to get Huntington's in the future? Now, the line between diagnostic and predictive sometimes can be a little more blurry. Sometimes a patient may say, I don't think I have Huntington's, but I've got a couple symptoms that I'm kind of worried about, or we may see a few things in clinic. And so the line between diagnostic and predictive isn't always black and white and clear. And I think at least in our practice, in our clinic, we tend to treat patients as they come to us. And if somebody comes in believing, I don't think I have symptoms of Huntington's, we meet them where they're at and treat it in a sense like a predictive case. And often people are asking these questions to plan their future, work, school, retirement, travel, family planning. Um, and often people I find, at least in my experience doing this, people have gotten to a point where they've really decided the certainty of knowing definitively that I've got the gene or not, while it could be bad news, for them is better or more constructive in their life than having the uncertainty. Um, and I think there's a really new shift in kind of what some of the motivation is for predictive testing, because people are starting to ask that last question of, will getting a predictive test help me participate in a clinical trial? And I think that's a lot of what professionals and scientists and physicians are wrestling with is, you know, beginning to incorporate this final question that patients are asking in, into the predictive testing process. The other types of genetic testing that we sometimes think about or talk about are prenatal or pre-implantation genetic testing. So when you've got somebody who either knows their genetic status or knows that they're potentially at risk and wants to do testing either during a pregnancy to know if the pregnancy is affected with the Huntington's gene or through doing in vitro fertilization, wants to do, go through a process in which they only select embryos that are unaffected, that is pre-implantation genetic testing. And so in a sense, you could call this together reproductive testing. And so those are the three broad categories that I kind of tend to think about. And a lot of people divide up Huntington's testing into diagnostic, predictive, and reproductive testing. Again, from a lab laboratory standpoint, there's not a lot of difference in what we're actually doing to get these results. It really has to do with what is the clinical scenario or what is the story that this patient is coming to me with or what types of questions they have. Okay, so now we're gonna to transition to life in a molecular lab. And I put all these glorious pictures of instruments and fancy clean white laboratories. The reality, if there's any people hanging out here who work in a laboratory, laboratories never look quite this good. But um, what are we doing in a molecular diagnostics laboratory? And, and I'm gonna kind of do a lot of shortcuts because this is a really brief talk today, just to get to kind of my what's new part of the talk, okay? So really when we're in a clinical diagnostic laboratory, we're not in the business of discovering things or finding new things for patients. That is the really critical work that research labs are doing. So the people who found the Huntington's gene, that was a research lab. 
I work in a clinical laboratory and we're the kind of laboratory that when you got tested for Huntington's and a blood sample was taken, it goes to a clinical lab. And what we're in the business of doing is doing cost effective, um, interpretable, reliable tests that give information back to patients. And in the case of Huntington's disease, what we're doing in our laboratory is, is in a sense, with your blood sample, telling you how many of these CAG repeats are there. And based on that, how would we interpret that information? So how is it that we're able to visualize two tiny, tiny little pieces of DNA? And the short answer, and again, this is not a molecular methods talk, is that we actually make millions and millions of fluorescent glowing copies of the Huntington CAG repeat. And so what we actually do is we can put these little things called primers, these little red bars on the ends of the CAG repeat. And what those primers do, they act like a copy machine. They make millions and millions of copies of these CAG repeats. And they're all tagged with a little fluorescent glowing probe. And we can use that fluorescence to visualize or to see these pieces of DNA. And then we can measure how big they are. And the idea is that a smaller CAG repeat, like the one with 17 up on top, is gonna to be a little bit smaller piece of DNA. And the one with 40 repeats is gonna be a little bit bigger piece of DNA. And so we can actually put this onto a really fancy instrument that separates out all these little fragments by size. And what we get here on the top panel, this is an example of a normal result. We get two big peaks of fluorescence, these big blue peaks. One of them I've labeled as 15. The other one I've labeled as 20. And this would be an example of a, a lab result we get in our lab for somebody with a normal result. Both of the repeat numbers are in that normal range, 15 and 20. The results on the bottom, this is an example of an abnormal or positive result. And there's a big blue peak here that I've labeled 17. And another blue peak over here that's kind of a little bit messier that's labeled as 63. And this would be a case of a patient with a fairly large expansion in the Huntington's gene of 63 repeats. And so again, what we're doing in the lab really is just making millions of copies of the CAG repeat that are tagged with a fluorescent glowing probe. And then we're sorting those out by size. And then we're figuring out how many CAG repeats we think a patient has, and then providing an interpretation. All right. So we went through this slide before. I'm just gonna show it again because I sort of hinted at, you know, sometimes things aren't quite as black and white. And here we're gonna to get to the part of the talk where this, a lot of this, what I've talked about is what's not new. Now we're gonna to get to a little bit about what's new. And one thing with science and biology, I think we always in science, we, we, we know that sometimes things aren't as black and white as what we talk about um, when we're talking to patients and other scientists. And so if we dig into Huntington's disease, I actually always begin with this when I'm teaching my students as an example of a simple genetic disease. And I say simple from the standpoint of there's one and only one gene that causes Huntington's. It's not complicated from the standpoint like some other diseases where there's maybe dozens of genes that can cause it. There's one gene that causes Huntington's. And there's only one genetic change that causes Huntington's. It's the CAG repeat expansion. And like I just showed you in the previous slide, we have really well established cutoffs for how to interpret the results. And so it seems like a very good example of a simple genetic disease. There's one gene, there's one change in the gene, and we have very clear guidelines about what all the different sizes of CAG repeats mean. But it's not that simple. We know, for example, that there are a few very rare examples when we have people in the normal range. There's at least one example of somebody who's had a 26 repeat that actually was able to grow all the way up into this range where it causes Huntington's when it was passed. And so even though we say 9 to 26 is normal, there's some evidence that there's some rare, rare cases where sometimes it's not. In the intermediate range, I sort of hinted earlier that there are some people in this intermediate range who really, really look like they have symptoms of Huntington's. And I think a lot of clinicians and scientists now believe that there are a very small number of people who have numbers in this range who actually do show symptoms of Huntington's. So again, these cutoffs aren't as black and white. When we get up to the reduced penetrance range, we ask that very fundamental question, why is it that some people in this range with the 37 repeats show symptoms, and then other people don't. We don't yet understand that. 
And finally, when we get into the full penetrance range of 40 or more, I'm sure all of you guys, you may have, for example, 42 repeats. Maybe your symptoms started when you were 43 years old and you've met somebody online who had the same repeat number who didn't show symptoms till they were 50. And why is that? You know, why is it the two people with the same repeat number can have such different ages of onset? And even more fundamental, why is it that the symptoms don't start until some particular age? You have that 42 repeat from the moment of your conception. Why is it that the symptoms don't start until you're maybe 40, 45 years old? So we know that the repeat number that we give on the report doesn't capture all of the complexity of Huntington's. If we take a little bit of a closer look at the repeat, in red, I've got the CAG repeat up on top. What we do when we say we're counting this, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. We're actually not counting the repeats in the way that you think. We're not going in and saying one, two, three, four, five, six, counting them all up. We're doing some shortcuts in the lab. We are really just making millions of copies of this repeat. And based on how big it is, we're inferring how many repeats there are. And there's actually some information that may be in there that we're not looking at and we're not reporting in the laboratory. And one of those things I kind of hint on the bottom, that on, in the bottom, there's two different bars, red bars of CAG repeats. One of them is pure CAGs from beginning to end. But the one on the very bottom in yellow, I've highlighted has a little interruption. It goes CAG, CAG, CAA, then CAG, CAG, CAG. And again, sort of little secret from the laboratory, we would never know this or see this because we're not actually going through and counting these CAG repeats. We're just figuring out how big this red bar containing all the CAG repeats is and assuming that it's all CAG repeats but for some people, there may actually be interruptions in there. And those interruptions may be part of the important answer to the question of, why are some repeats more unstable than others? Why do some tend to grow when they're passed and others don't? Why do some people with the same repeat size have earlier onset or later onset? So again, one clue may be in the actual content of the repeats that there could be interruptions. Another little clue is on top, I show this big red bar with the CAG repeats, and then there's sort of this block of other, it goes CAA, CAG, CCG. Some people have variations in the sequence in the blue region over here, where the CAG actually keeps going past the end of where we think it usually should end in people. And again, as a laboratory, the way we're doing this testing, we're not aware when stuff like that happens. And so some people, even though the stuff in the red may be the same size, they may have genetic variations in their own personal sequence that extends the CAG repeat. Okay, so take home message from that for what's new is that the CAG repeat is actually more complex than what we talk about often on the reports. When we talk about the CAG repeat number, there's actually some things like interruptions and extensions of the repeat that we know can happen in some people that may be part of the clue of what's going on for some of those questions I was talking about, like why is the repeat unstable in some people but not others? Why do some people with reduced penetrance show symptoms and others don't? So there are some complexities. One really critical take home message I want you to take from today's talk is if you ask the question, does this mean my CAG repeat number is wrong? Um, the answer is no. The CAG repeat number you got from the laboratory is absolutely accurate. It is the way that we report these tests for the last 30 years in the United States and through Canada and most of Europe and throughout a lot of the world. So I'm not trying to imply, absolutely not trying to imply that your CAG repeat number is wrong or inaccurate. But what I'm really getting at is in the future, there are some subtleties and nuances about the repeat that, that may be started to be reported to patients in the future, okay? So don't go to your doctor and say, oh my gosh, I heard my CAG repeat number is inaccurate. That's absolutely not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that as we've learned more, there may be some changes in how we talk about this in the future, okay? And so when is that coming? I think it's important that we realize before we start reporting information like this, we need to know that it is both accurate to report to patients and that it is clinically useful on a patient by patient basis. And so I think as we start to get that evidence that we can accurately look at these other complexities 
and it is meaningful to you, the individual patient, I think then we'll start to see some of this information incorporated into your results. In the meantime, the result you have is absolutely up to date and accurate, but I'm just giving you some clues and hints about what's new with the CAG repeat. So I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions now in the session. And so I will wrap up my talk and open it up to questions. Thank you very much, everybody. All right, everybody, thank you for listening to, into all that. And I've got a few questions that have popped up in the chat, so I'm just going to answer those. Um, they're great questions. I wish we could have a discussion, but we only have about four minutes to rock and roll with this. So the first question, which was marked as high priority, is I don't want to do all that counseling stuff. I know about Huntington's disease. Why can't I just go to my primary care doctor to order the predictive test? I, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think this is something a lot of patients express. And I think sometimes when we say, hey, you have to go to a Huntington Center or some experts, I think sometimes people think it's because we feel like we have to try to explain all this. And really, in reality, I absolutely understand that you have a lived experience with this and have a great deal of knowledge and expertise. And I think I tend to sort of answer a question like this of, if you're having something very complicated done in any other area of your life, whether it be a legal question or fixing a complex problem in your house, you would go to an expert because you know that that expert has a really big body of experience. Um, when there's unusual things that come up, they've seen those things before. They know how to appreciate those things and to, and to talk about them. And so they're drawing on real experience in those situations. Um, the other thing that I think is important for that is, you know, if you get testing through somebody who really is not connected with the Huntington's community, I think there's a piece lacking of, is that person aware of what's going on with research and clinical trials, getting you plugged into all those pieces there. And so that's another reason why I think it is important to have the testing done as much as possible through a Huntington Center or through somewhere that knows a lot about Huntington's. Otherwise, I think some of the concern is we end up with a lot of patients who are gene positive out there who are really not connected to good information and aren't connected to what's going on with clinical trials. Now, that being said, I think we've had some really important changes um, through COVID. We have all of a sudden learned that things like video visits and telephone visits actually can work in some situations. And I think to me, that's you know, we used to require all these visits in person. And for some patients, that was a big barrier to seeing us. They had to drive three, four hours, take a day off work. And I think we've come to learn that we can really still provide some really good care um, through some of these new models. And so I, I think it's a really good way in which we've been able to meet patients and make some of the barriers and hurdles to testing lower. So that was one of the questions that were there. Um, let's see here. So looking at the other questions, two of the questions I think I can kind of tie together. Why don't laboratories report this additional information about the CAG repeat? The scientists are really excited about it. And also I was tested many years ago. Do I need to be retested? As I kind of indicated at the end of the talk, there are a lot of things that scientists and researchers get very interested in that we know are probably important but it takes a fair bit of time to get the data in place to be able to say on a patient by patient basis, you know, if you've got 41 repeats and two interruptions versus 41 repeats and one interruption, if I'm going to be telling you the information about that interruption, I need to be able to tell you what is the meaningful difference there. And I think we're still in the process of appreciating what those differences are. And I think we will get to the point where a lot of that information is included as part of a standard Huntington's test. But if we're gonna make the test more complicated and more expensive, 
we need to know that that information is meaningful to the patient that we're giving it to. And absolutely at this point in time, there's no need to repeat your test. We actually, we've been doing Huntington's testing in our lab since 1994. We run the exact same test today that we ran in 1994. So there is not a need today to repeat your test to get this new information or to make it more accurate. I think it's just to make people aware that there are some complexities and nuances that we know are coming down the road. And just to kind of get you ahead of the curve that there may be more information in the future. I believe that puts me at the end. All right. So yes, I just got the prompt. So thank you very much for listening to my talk and um, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.